Everyone likes to rag on stories in video games because, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of games have stories that really suck. But I'd say for the most part, video game stories actually fare better than a lot of other mediums. Have you been to the movies lately? I mean, for the amount of money that movie studios pump into movies, you'd think they'd write better scripts, but no. And I'm not naming names, but I mean, you all live in the same world I do, where movies are doing that. And to be frank, video games just make it easier to accept a story because you see a little bit more of the moments and pacing resembles real life just a bit more than Hollywood movies. Again, it's not as though I'm saying video game stories can't be bad, but I do want to talk about some that are very good. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 games with the best stories. Starting off with number 10, probably an obvious one, but The Last of Us Part 1. Can I say one more times in a sentence? Probably, but let's not find out. I guess we're starting off with this one because it's, it's kind of like one of those what more is left to say. It's got uh, nothing left to prove to anybody. They adapted it to an HBO miniseries to huge acclaim. I'll still say I think the game was better, but I don't know. What makes it special to me isn't really the plot setup. Uh, the plot setup's pretty much children of men with zombies. And yeah, the characters are well-defined and the acting's really good, especially back when the game first came out. It was frankly next level compared to what we were used to in games at that point. Where were you, Tess? West End District. Hey, we had a drop to make. We. We had a drop to make. Well, you wanted to be left alone, remember? But for me, when I was playing the game, I was just sitting there wondering what it is that really takes this game to the next level as a video game story. And maybe this is controversial, but I think what does it is the ending. Now, keeping in mind, the ending wouldn't matter if it weren't for the journey to the ending. And again, the characters are so well fleshed out and well acted that that all contributes to the ending impacting, but man, do they stick the landing. It's difficult, enigmatic, and intentionally frustrating, and it was daring in, in a way few games are. The Left Behind DLC also deserves special mention for the way it expands the narrative toolbox of games by making long sections of the story where there's no combat. Oh, come on. First aid kit. In other games, it would be boring, but the way Naughty Dog incorporated narrative into the gameplay of those sections was really advanced. It's one of my favorite games ever, and it set the standard for story-based games for years to come. And number nine is Alan Wake 2. Remedy and their head creative director, Sam Lake, have been doing exciting and innovative stories in video games for decades now. Uh, the way they've managed to integrate live action with gameplay has always been a defining feature of the studio, and the stories in their games have always been very good. Before Alan Wake, I'd probably put Max Payne 2's grim noir love story as probably my favorite thing they've ever done. It's a much more complex and mature sequel and felt very ahead of its time back in 2003. In fact, honestly, in fact, narratively speaking, if you take all the tack out of the way, it's probably still ahead of the curve. Like, they just have a thing for sequels, I guess. It may be recency bias talking, but Alan Wake 2 is probably my favorite thing Remedy has done. If the first game was Twin Peaks, this new one is Twin Peaks Season 3. It's uh, disorienting, dark as hell, and exhilarating, and there's just nothing else like it. Remedy goes all in on their particular quirks to great effect. Everything gets cranked to the excess, uh, the live action blending of real and digital characters, the way the story constantly breaks the fourth wall and observes the thin layer between reality and fiction, the entire meta-narrative about self-loathing and the hardships of creative endeavors. The story it brought me here brought me nowhere. Loop me back. I was writing this story, and in the story I now stepped into the writer's room. But there was no one here writing. It's all here, and it's all nuts. The whole thing is aggressively strange, and I'm not sure how much was actually accomplished over the course of the story, but that barely matters, because this is a game with Remedy at its full power. It's gloriously weird to see. And I'm putting a lot of emphasis on oddball stuff, but this game does have a legitimately good story, and it, it contains some of the studio's most mature writing, especially the stuff with Alice. I moved to New York thinking I'd make it as an artist. And then I met Alan. We had a good thing. Like, it's, it's heartbreaking. This is a game that I can talk about for hours, but I have to keep going, obviously. 
At number eight is Soma. I, I did not expect a game like this out of the Amnesia devs. Uh, that game was great, but the writing wasn't anything to write home about. That said, Soma's story is one of the best sci-fi stories in the medium. It's a nightmare scenario that's uncomfortably plausible. Now, what stands out to me about the game is how unflattering it is about technology. Even games that tend to lean on the more cynical side of things tend to ignore just how fragile and prone to failure technology is. The story of Soma starts off brilliantly, with seeing a normal guy waking up one day, getting his brain scanned for research, uh, in any other game, you'd think that the details of his life are important or that the research organization is something sinister, but the game brilliantly subverts our expectations by making many of the answers to the mysteries much more mundane than we would expect. It doesn't make the game less horrifying, though. You wake up in a crumbling underwater research base haunted by bizarre machines, but it's the story that's really the scary part. The notes are surprisingly well written written, and the portrait they paint of the future is very dark. Life on the surface is over, and the only way mankind even has a chance of surviving, at least in the minds of the scientists, is to upload human minds into a satellite. It's one of those sci-fi premises we just accept, but the game goes a long way to point out how absurd an idea the whole thing is. How did she die? You got into a fight with your colleagues. They didn't want to risk launching the Ark, thought it might not make it through the atmosphere. They killed me? I'm sure it was an accident. They were just trying to stop you from launching. So much of the game is about how people cling to magical thinking when faced with reality. It's so powerful that we, the player, even start to fall for it, like before the game pulls the rug out from under you at the end, with one of the most sobering and horrific endings of all time. And number seven is Telltale's Tales from the Borderlands. Telltale's made a ton of great stories, but the names I see most often when people talk about uh, them are The Walking Dead Season 1, The Wolf Among Us, and Tales from the Borderlands, and one of these things is not like the other. The first two are based off critically acclaimed comic books, while the third game is an adventure game set in the Borderlands universe. Now, these aren't exactly heralded as pinnacles of storytelling. In fact, tons of people hate these games based on the writing alone, but Tales from Borderlands is different. It's a uh, good, like not like there's a certain quality to it that is enjoyable. Like, there is stuff to enjoy from Borderlands, I'm not knocking it, but it's certainly not just an automatically good narrative. Tales from the Borderlands is. And everybody assumed it would be terrible. It came out the same time as their Game of Thrones game, which was a property that was hot as hell in 2014 to 2015, and by all rights was the thing everyone assumed would be what got all the attention. But in the ultimate twist of fate, Game of Thrones ended up being one of Telltale's worst, while Tales from the Borderlands was arguably their best. The game tells a dual narrative between a corporate stooge and a fast-talking con artist doing what everyone does in the Borderlands games, looking for a vault. The writing is fun, the characters are great, the presentation is some of Telltale's best, and the game just has a manic energy that you rarely see in adventure games. Its pace is absolutely relentless. On any other day, I would have put The Walking Dead or Wolf Among Us on this list, because they're really good too, but Tales from the Borderlands is just the ultimate lightning in a bottle from this studio. It's the game that never should have worked, but it ended up being one of their best. You gotta keep an eye on your friends during this Helios mission, huh? Unlike how you're not keeping an eye on that tripwire. Uh, what? And number six is Silent Hill 2, the ethereal horror game. It's been talked about to death, right? But it still deserves a mention on this list. Back in 2001, there just wasn't anything else like this game. Hell, the Silent Hill series never managed to top it, at least in terms of storytelling. What starts off as an interesting horror premise, where a husband gets a letter from his deceased wife, which is intriguing, continues uh, with some crazy themes that only really become apparent by the end of the game. If you know anything about it, you probably already know the big twist, so I won't belabor the point, but even now, it's one of the best twists of all time. It recontextualizes everything that happens in a really interesting way, and I think the game deserves a lot of credit for how it handled the story, too. It's subtle and relatable in a way most game stories, let alone horror game stories, just aren't. They could have made James's irredeemable monster to really hammer home the point, but he remains sympathetic even when things aren't sympathetic. Even now, after all these years, the final letter from Mary is devastating. It's one of the all-time great pieces of writing in video games. It's one of those games lesser studios have attempted to emulate for years, but so much of the twist of you're actually the bad guy, you're actually the killer, you're delusional, it's kind of become a cliche. Most of the time, these sorts of twists are just lame as hell, and Silent Hill 2 is like this amazing beacon of good.
And number five, Mafia Definitive Edition. In 2002, there were plenty of excellent stories, but they took place in fantasy worlds or they were horror games or whatever Metal Gear Solid is. Uh, like Games were still seeped in the unnatural. It was rare to see a game that was set in what's mostly the real world told seriously, like normal. The original Mafia came out only a year after Grand Theft Auto 3, which is also a groundbreaking game, but Rockstar was still kind of playing in the kiddie pool with storytelling. Mafia was something very different. It told the story of a mobster's rise and fall in a straightforward and serious manner, and while its visuals don't hold up and the acting wasn't always great, the game was way ahead of its time when it comes to story and presentation. And in 2020, the game was remade from the ground up as Mafia Definitive Edition, and it took the bones of the story from the original and improved it in pretty much every way. The dialogue and presentation got major improvements, but the actual events of the story remained relatively unchanged. Which just goes to show how good the original really was, because it is genuinely one of my favorite stories in games. Now, the rise and fall of a gangster is well trod around in movies, and this game takes a lot of obvious inspiration from movies like Once Upon a Time in America, The Godfather, Goodfellas, the list goes on, uh, but it has its own unique identity. The end of the story where things fall apart is especially great, and it ends with one of the all-time great bleak endings in video games. Nobody's carrying you to the doctor this time, Sam. You kill me now in the dawn. She's never gonna stop looking for you. But you let me live. I'll tell Salieri you're dead. You can disappear. Just like Frank. And number four is The Longest Journey. This epic adventure game doesn't get the love these days that it used to, but for me, it's still one of the best stories ever told in video games. This was a wildly ambitious game, uh, dimension hopping with some notoriously nonsensical puzzles, but the writing, story, and voice acting just remain excellent. What makes this game unique is just how naturally it flows between high fantasy, sci-fi, and slice of life. It, it gives a game an almost novel-like story structure that can come off as slow, but some of the best bits of the game are about the main character just chatting with their friends and dealing with relatable problems. The character writing is absolutely excellent. Even the smallest characters are well-defined and really interesting, and the worlds you explore are dense with backstory and little details that make them feel more real. It's one of the best adventure games simply on the merits of its story. So, you've come to hear me tell a story, have you? If you please, we would love to hear one of your stories. You have seen so much. You have lived so long. Oh, so good of you to remind me of my age, child. No, don't worry. I am an old woman, but I've lived a long and fulfilling life, and I do have stories to tell. Which story would you like to hear? And number three is Ghost Trick Phantom Detective. Listen, we all love the Phoenix Wright games, but this game is undoubtedly Shutakimi's masterpiece. It, it's a brilliantly devised puzzle box of a plot that unravels at lightning speed. It's gotta be one of the all-time great setups for a game. You're a ghost with no memories of who you are, and you have to solve the mystery of your death before the night is over. It's a simple setup, but the game's story is anything but simple. It quickly spirals into a web of conspiracies, crimes, and secrets that date back decades Decades, all told with a cheerful chaotic energy that would turn the story into a convoluted mess if it came from anyone else. The characters are instantly iconic from their designs to their personality, the writing's clever and sharp, and the gameplay is equally clever and sharp. Uh, it cannot be understated just how good of a dog Missile is. Uh, Ghost Trick, it, it's just a game that proves that video game stories don't need to be grim and depressing to be good. Not to say the story doesn't go to some dark places once in a while, but that's not what this game is about. It's a game that revels in the love of mysteries and puzzles, and it's hard not to get swept up in that positive energy. And number two is Metal Gear Solid 3. After taking a wild experiment swing with the Metal Gear series with Sons of Liberty, the third game did something even more unexpected. Uh, it was a prequel. And there's so many lame prequels, but this game is anything but. It was a refresh that the series kind of merited. Not that Metal Gear Solid 2 isn't fantastic. I love Metal Gear Solid 2, and I'll be the first to tell you that the story 
correctly diagnosed and predicted the media landscape for several decades. But it's not quite as cohesive as Metal Gear Solid 3, and as well-rounded as some of the characters are in 2, all of the characters have it in 3. And all of these well-rounded, fleshed-out characters exist in this Cold War setting that's incredibly interesting, and the twists are, are, are borderline sensible. There's no nanomachines in sight. In fact, the MacGuffin in this game is a big bunch of money. That doesn't mean the story is boring or straightforward, not by a long shot. It's just that, relatively speaking, it is obviously the most grounded story in the entire series. The game also does one of my favorite things a story can do, which is split the antagonist so there's one utterly despicable bad guy and one actually sympathetic bad guy. Volgan is an all-time great series bad guy, he's just a hateable monster, but the boss is one of the most enigmatic and interesting figures the series ever had, and the big twist related to her at the end is just such a gut punch. The ending in general is just one of the best, most satisfying conclusions in any game ever. Like, the final few hours of this game just can't be beat. <sighs> Snake. How's it look? Pretty bad. And finally, at number one is Planescape Torment. The late 90s was a really good time to be a PC gamer. Between Black Isle and Bioware, you got Fallout 1 and 2, the Ballers Gate games, and of course, Planescape Torment. Don't get me wrong, they all had fantastic writing, but Torment really had a step above everybody else. It's a much more limited game compared to all those other CRPGs. You're playing a specific character, a nameless one, rather than a custom character, and the story itself is a lot more linear and gated than the other games, but in this case it works to the game's benefit because the writing and story are incredibly good. Set in the city of Sigil, you play as an immortal attempting to reclaim your memories. It's not a story about saving the world or stopping some bad guys, it's much more personal, and it just happens to be set in a very strange world. The writing is uniformly excellent the entire way through, which is very good because there is a lot of it. The game sometimes feels like you're doing more reading than actually playing, which is probably for the best because the actual combat isn't incredible, let's say. Thankfully, there's not a lot of it. In gameplay terms, this is probably the weakest game put out by Black Isle, but the story makes up for it and then some. It's an extremely unconventional game in a lot of ways, but if you're willing to roll with it, it'll stick with you for good. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.